Jeff Flake, former senator from the state of Arizona, thank you so much for being part of Three Questions. Glad to be here. Throughout your career in the U.S. Senate, you had relatively low approval ratings and high <laughs> disapproval ratings just about through the whole career. What is it that you did that made the people of Arizona so angry? There is no currency these days for reaching across the aisle or bipartisanship. Um, you, if you're the, the man in the middle, um, both sides get angry. Uh, the way this, uh, our political culture has developed, the way the media is, uh, particularly with the addition of social media, um, it, it pushes people toward the extremes. And uh, if you're in the middle trying to forge solutions to problems, uh, it's, it's not a, a popular place to be most of the time. So were there no opportunities for you to gain friends back <laughs> no, home I mean, your, among it, your constituency? In terms of, uh, of being popular to win re-election, obviously as a Republican you need to re win a Republican primary. Uh, it's very difficult to win a Republican primary these days unless you're in lockstep with where the president is, uh, particularly in Arizona. You know, the president had said that he has uh, upwards of 88 or 90 percent support in the party and of those who vote in Republican primaries that's probably true. So it, it's, it's difficult to, to be even a skeptic of some of the president's moves let alone a critic of the president and survive a Republican primary. By the same token you'll, you'll never move if you're a conservative you'll never move as far as the left wants you to move and so you, you, you really aren't popular with that group either and so you're kind of in the middle, and it's a, it's a tough position to be in. Did you find it ironic that uh, in an atmosphere where the president was right. criticizing, openly criticizing, uh, criticizing and denigrating the senior senator right. from Arizona, John McCain, that you could not come in in a more conciliatory tone and, tr and criticize the president, but also make friends in your constituency right. as well? Well, uh, that, that was one of the things that really bothered me at the beginning uh, during the campaign is him saying that he couldn't respect John McCain because, uh, you know, he, he was captured. Um, I thought that that was out of bounds. I think a lot of my Arizona constituents did as well. But the hardcore, some of the hardcore Republicans were just fine with that kind of rhetoric. And uh, I don't think we should be. And I, I think it was important to speak out. And so, I, I mean, if you're not trying to calculate whatever move or statement you make with regard to the president's behavior or policies, uh, you know, if you just let your conscience guide, uh, you know, where that goes politically, uh, you know, you just have to be okay with, and I certainly am. One and done. Yeah. Is I that was, what you <laughs> thought was going to happen I was when in you the, ran for the Senate? I was in the House for, you know, 12 years, six terms there and uh, six years in the Senate, 18 years, a pretty good time to be in Washington. So I've had a, a very blessed political career and, and life, and I'm fine with that. I thought I'd probably serve two terms in the Senate. Uh, that would be, uh, you know, you work hard to get to the Senate. You think one, one time for re-election would be good. Some people go well beyond, that's great. Uh, but for me, uh, the price for that, in my case, would have been to stand on a campaign stage with the president in Arizona, to be okay when people shout, lock her up, or, or things like that, and I, I just couldn't do it. Uh, that was the bottom line, and uh, that was the cost for me uh, to win re-election, is to be okay with some of the president's policies, which I am not okay with, and to condone some of the behavior he's exhibited, which I simply can't do. How did we get to the point <laughs> where members of both parties have to either rubber stamp right. approval or disapproval right. of what the president is doing and then pay the political cost yeah. afterwards. Well, that's interesting. We haven't always been here. Um, you know, people have, have been able to criticize the president's uh, uh, policies or disagree with him. Just take, uh, you know, George W. Bush. Uh, I disagreed with him vehemently on uh, education policy. I thought it was too federal government centric. Uh, the prescription drug benefit I voted against, and uh, he was pushing hard the other way. On Cuba policy, I butted heads with the, the White House, the Bush White House, for years. Yet, uh, I agreed with him on some things and worked with him on some things. 
And then when he left office and I ran for the Senate, he came and did a fundraiser for me. Um, you know, it was, uh, it was just, you know, most presidents are okay with that. And in the past, our constituency has been okay with that. I, I certainly thought that given the, you know, the, the skepticism a lot of my party had about President Trump, <coughs> that uh, they would appreciate a senator who you know, said, I'll, I'll challenge him when I think he's wrong and agree with him when he's right. Um, but that's not how it's evolved. Uh, the politics today, you're kind of with him or you're against him. Uh, it's us versus them. That's kind of how the president plays politics, and a lot of the party has followed. Uh, I don't think that that's good for the party, uh, politically, certainly. I, I don't think it's the way to, to keep majorities in the future. And on some of the policies, it's, it's not, not good as well. Utah Senator Mitt Romney is at the beginning of his freshman right. term, very much like you were, a man who stands on principle and criticizes President Trump when he feels like he's in the wrong. Right. Uh, what advice would you give to Senator Romney, uh, having tread the road that he <laughs> is now embarked on, where criticizing the president is something that he is happy to do if he feels like it needs to be done? Well, I don't need to give uh, Mitt Romney any advice. He doesn't need to take any from me. But uh, I've, I've an admirer of his. I've been for a long time, and I've admired uh, how he's handled himself in the Senate so far. I thought that it was important that he do that op-ed right before he entered the Senate to let people know, you know, where he was and that he would stand with the president when he thought he was right, criticize him when he was wrong, and I think he's done so. And uh, the president needs to hear that, and the party needs to be reminded, the Republican Party needs to be reminded what being conservative really means. Uh, commitment to limited government, economic freedom, free trade, and strong American leadership across the globe. And, uh, I think uh, Mitt Romney's done a good job at holding to Republican values there. You have said that a traditional conservative is one who favors limited government, right. free trade and open markets and, right. and uh, immigration reform and those kinds of things. You feel like the Republican Party has strayed from that. How so? Oh, definitely. I wrote a book about it. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, if you look at limited government, we're running trillion dollar deficits in times of plenty. You know, they, these are good economic conditions and we're still running trillion dollar deficits. That's hardly limited government. Um, in terms of free trade, obviously a president that openly says that he's a tariff man and has used tariffs again and again to try to push or nudge countries in, in different directions. Um, it's okay to use tools at your disposal, but free trade is important. These trade agreements that we have are important. And the, the, the difficulty I see is what country will want to enter into a free trade agreement with us if they know that that you know, isn't worth the paper it's written on? And how to, what does it say about our commitment to international institutions that we built, like NATO, security arrangements, uh, trade institutions like the World Trade Organization, those have led to the most prosperous time in the history of the world, have liberated uh, nations from, from poverty, and yet we seem to be turning our backs on that. That has long-term implications, and I'm very concerned about where we are. You describe a political atmosphere where the extremes are the norm, right. and we are led by a president who does things that you don't agree with. How much of the issue of uh, political dysfunction do you believe comes from Congress, right. and how much of it is coming from the president? Well, I, I mentioned I, I wrote a book uh, about this and noted that a lot of these conditions were there when the president got here. He took advantage of them. He's exacerbated some of them. Uh, he's divided uh, where there was unity. Uh, but a lot of these conditions existed before, and we were ripe for kind of a populist uh, type of movement. Um, but uh, yeah, we've, we've moved away from the principles that animated the Republican Party for a long time. And, and I think that uh, if we continue down this road, uh, basically kind of these nativist positions, um, harsh politics, uh, that's just not, uh, the, you know, that's just not the politics I remember. That's not what uh, made us, you know, rally to the party for me under Ronald Reagan, for example. And, and I'm concerned that uh, too many people, particularly young people, are being turned off of politics, particularly 
being turned off of, of the Republican Party. We're losing millennials uh, right and left. And uh, obviously, we, we, we can't continue as a major force if we're going to do so as a party. So um, I'm concerned at where we are. And, uh, but if you look right now, obviously, I think the president has, has tested the limits on a, a lot of issues. But our institutions are holding. Uh, we have a strong and vibrant free press. Uh, the president, I don't think, is right in calling it the enemy of the people, uh, those outlets that he doesn't like. Uh, that's destructive, particularly abroad. Um, his warming up to despots and, and uh, authoritarians really doesn't help our image around the globe. Uh, but, uh, but we'll right ourselves again. Uh, pendulums tend to swing in politics, and uh, sometimes with a vengeance. I'm just afraid, as a Republican and as a conservative, that we're in for really tough times ahead unless we uh, have some kind of course correction. In 2017, you rose on the floor of the Senate to announce your right. uh, retirement right. from the Senate after one term. And it was a, a fiery indictment of politics, uh, extreme politics, and mm -hmm. of the president and his uh, behavior in office. Then you left office. Fifteen months later, so it's kind of a fifteen job months notice, uh, <laughs> right? Pretty, pretty early. <laughs> what I'm asking is, there are those who would say, "Well, why didn't he stick around right. and help solve the problem?" And what are you doing now to fix it? Well, um, one, you have to be able to stick there in office. And had I stuck to the criticism, I think that are still valid criticisms that I made at that time. I would not have been able to win re-election. That's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. I had to make a choice there. Uh, do I stand up and speak? Or do I say, you know, these policies that I've had a problem with, Muslim ban, uh, this anti-immigration sentiment, uh, these other things, and the, the behavior the president was exhibiting, uh, I was, you know, not okay. But now I'm okay with that. Uh, I just couldn't do that. I, I just couldn't. And uh, so I, I wasn't suggesting that I would have more power and influence out of office. You don't. You have more power when you're in office. Um, but you, you need to be able to sleep at night as well. You need to be able to, uh, you know, um, look yourself, look your, in, the yeah, look yourself in, in the mirror, mirror and yeah. your, your family. Um, and, and that's where I felt I needed to be. But uh, I'm, I'm using my voice where I can. I, I'm working uh, with CBS News, for example, on a series called Common Ground. We aired a segment uh, just about a month ago. We'll be airing them every five weeks or so. You know, Common Ground may be scarce in Washington, but it's alive and well everywhere else, and those stories need to be told. Uh, we need people to, to realize that this too shall pass, and, uh, and we, we need to be back to ourselves again, where we admire people in office. There are good people in, in Washington, Republicans and Democrats, trying to do the right thing. Uh, the incentives are horribly wrong right now, uh, particularly with social media. And the, the rewards just aren't there uh, for people who want to actually solve problems, uh, work across the aisle, which we need to do. Uh, but we'll get back to ourselves again. In reaction to the Mueller report on allegations of collusion, you said that th there was no prosecutable uh, and the Mueller report said there was no prosecutable right. crimes going mm -hmm. on here. But you did say that based on what was in that report, the president should not be reelected. Right. There are those who have not read and are not going to read the Robert Mueller report. What specifically in that report disqualifies him for reelection? Well, uh, prior to the Mueller report coming out, I w wasn't a fan of uh, reelecting the president. Uh, I think the Mueller report does not suggest the president should be impeached. But if you read the Mueller report, it certainly suggests he should not be reelected. Uh, some of the behavior in there, and Mitt Romney uh, uh, in a column uh, put a lot of this out. But the, but the president instructing those, his underlings, uh, to fire Bob Mueller, uh, for example, and then going back to them and trying to suggest that he didn't, or that they um, suggest, or that they write that he had not. Uh, made that move. Uh, those aren't things that would recommend somebody for re-election. Uh, so I, I hope that we think long and hard. I still hope uh, the Republican Party uh, would nominate somebody other than the president because I would rather have a Republican in the White House, uh, but not at all costs. And uh, so I, th that's where I am. Have you considered 
challenging President Trump for the Republican presidential nomination in 2020. You know, I've been doing this for 18 years. Uh, it's time, you know, let's let the fever cool <laughs> for a while. Uh, and, you know, I, I think everybody considers that. But this is the president's party right now, no doubt. Uh, if he wants the nomination, he's going to get it. Uh, I, I, I think that that will likely lead uh, to somebody else being elected. Um, I wish that uh, Republicans would decide beforehand that four years is enough, let's move on. But it doesn't look like we will. President Donald Trump has challenged China on trade and some of the shenanigans going right. on there. He has gotten tough on illegal immigration and the economy is singing along very well. Mm -hmm. So on what's it, wrong with a, a, <laughs> a Trump presidency? We, uh, coming into the Trump presidency as a country, uh, desperately needed a more conducive tax and regulatory environment for business to be done. Uh, the Congress, Republican Congress, had been pushing for that before. We couldn't get it under the old administration. In fact, it went the other way in terms of particularly regulatory uncertainty. Uh, President Trump has agreed with Congress and in some ways has made the right moves with regard to that. And the economy is humming along as a result. Long term, there are some major signs showing, particularly if we don't uh, uh, you know, stick to the free trade model that we've had. Uh, but the economy is going well. Illegal immigration, uh, there hasn't been much change. We've had a tremendous crisis recently on the border, particularly from the Northern Triangle countries. Uh, but if, if uh, the Mexican economy, for example, were to tank or go bad, then we'd have more pressures on the border. So I, I don't think the moves that the president has made have particularly helped with regard to immigration. We desperately need comprehensive immigration reform. We passed that back in 2013, just couldn't get the House to do it. Um, but, uh, you know, there are th some things that uh, I agree with what the president has done, many things I don't agree with. Back in the Clinton era, the buzz phrase was, it's the economy, stupid. Mm -hmm. Is it still the economy? Could that get President yes. Trump reelected? Oh, oh, no doubt, particularly if the Democrats nominate somebody from the far left of their party, if they respond, uh, you know, in kind, if you will. Um, with uh, a Bernie Sanders type or somebody like that, then I think it's a very real possibility the president would be reelected. On the other hand, if the Democrats nominate a more centrist member, um, then I think it, uh, you know, the advantage goes to the Democrats. You served on the Senate Judiciary Committee during the Brett Kavanaugh hearings. A lot of political commotion right. and clamor, including the confrontation you had with two women in that elevator. Uh, what did we as a country learn by going through that process? I hope we learned something. Now, certainly with the Me Too era has come, uh, I think, people being more accountable for things like that. I felt that we hadn't, prior to the FBI investigation being done, we hadn't done due diligence as we should have in the Senate. Um, but uh, I, I think the, the problem with the judiciary now is, or the way we process the judiciary, the president's nominees, it's become uh, far more political uh, than it needs to be, should be, or has been. And I don't know how we put that genie back in the bottle if uh, we have a Democratic president who comes and says, well, they nominated extreme uh, you know, people, so we're going to do the same, and everything is going to be a party line vote. That's a big change from where we were just a decade, decade and a half ago, and that's, that's uh, that's not good for the country, it really isn't. So how do we avoid it? How do we fix it going forward? Well, it's, it's not so much rules changes as behavioral changes in the Senate. If we can have leadership um, on, the how, on the Republican side and the Democratic side who will say, let's get back to uh, the way we used to do this. You know, prior to 2003, nobody ever filibustered the president's executive calendar, meaning the judicial nominees or cabinet picks, ambassadorial nominations. It just wasn't done anybody could have in the Senate. They just didn't do that. And uh, we have to get back to a time where there's some kind of restraint uh, among members uh, and uh, some kind of trust. But, but that's kind of gone by the wayside as well. Uh, members of Congress just don't know as well uh, each other as well as they used to. Um, Democrats and Republicans don't socialize as much as they used to. And, uh, and that's led to a lot of the breakdowns in trust that we have right now.
And then when you have a, a figure in the White House who looks at every turn to, you know, divide rather than to unify, that doesn't help either. He didn't bring all of this on, but he, but he certainly uh, made it worse. Finally, you're about to embark <laughs> on a six-day survival trip to a small island out in the Pacific somewhere. Right. Why are you doing that? <laughs> you know, I, this started when I was a kid. I read a lot of sailing books. I grew up on a dry, dusty ranch in Snowflake, Arizona, and just loved the water and stories about the water. Sailing Adventures Gone Bad was my favorite genre. <laughs> and uh, I always wondered if I were marooned on an island, could I survive with minimal tools? And, Finally, 10 years ago, my wife was so tired of hearing me talk about this. She said, if this is your midlife crisis, get it over with, <laughs> would you? Maroon yourself. <laughs> and, uh, and so I did, 10 years ago this summer, on an island called Jabinwat in the middle of the Pacific in the Marshall Islands with minimal tools, uh, no food, obviously, and uh, survived for seven days, seven nights. And a few years later, took our two youngest kids, had the same kind of experience with no, no technology, no cell phones, no uh, distractions. It was wonderful. And then uh, when I got to the Senate, I was so disgusted at the lack of bipartisanship. Uh, Martin Heinrich, a Democratic senator from New Mexico, and I cooked up an idea that we'd go to back to that island and show that Republicans and Democrats can get along. And, and we did. We did six days. A Discovery Channel came and filmed the experience. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't naked and afraid. <laughs> uh, afraid, <goodness>. maybe. <laughs> yes. uh, but uh, we came back. And, we went on a lot of shows to talk about it. Stephen Colbert ran a clip of us, you know, spirit of fish or eating coconut. He said, Flake and Heinrich proved once and for all Republicans and Democrats can get along when <laughs> death is the only option. <laughs> so, but this experience, uh, I was talking to the folks at, at Podium, a wonderful startup company here in, in, in Utah, a tech company that's growing very rapidly. Uh, their executives were enthralled by this kind of experience and they wanted to go themselves. Uh, so the six top executives uh, of Podium, including the CEO, um, are going to go. And uh, it's uh, a lot different than doing trust falls in a holiday in a ballroom yeah. for, uh, for, <laughs> for corporate types to, uh, you know, do team building. Yeah. Uh, but it'll be a great experience. We'll have no food, uh, no water. We'll just take a desal pump, um, some spears uh, to spear fish. Uh, maybe a magnifying glass to light a fire. And you're the tour guide? Is that I the guess whole so. point? <laughs> but also, Podium is, uh, there's an island called Ebai in the Marshall Islands, uh, near, well, quite a distance, but still in the vicinity of where we're going to be going. It's 80 acres big with 12,000 people on it, one of the most densely populated places on Earth. And the Marshall Islands is ground zero for climate change. Mm. Uh, about 1,200 islands there. Uh, not one point of which is more than six feet above sea level. So as the seas rise, that population is going. And most of them are coming here. We have a special relationship with the Marshallese. Uh, they have U.S. passports. They don't need work permits. So about a quarter of them are already here. And uh, some are coming with very few skills, uh, technology skills. So Podium is taking a bunch of computers. They're setting up a computer lab there. Uh, they're going to do some online uh, coding courses for some of the Marshallese. So they're doing some good, too. Uh, so it's going to be team building on one side and some mentorship on the other. And uh, I hope we all come back. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure your wife does, too. <laughs> she does. Yeah, all right. Well, Senator Jeff Flake from the great state of Arizona, former senator now, right. thank you so thank much you. for being part of Three Questions. Thank you.